on behalf of our dear Rhoda Bill Wilton, Miss Nunu, on behalf of Dr. Rod Wilton, Dr. John, Don Wilton, Dr. Murray Wilton, and the entire Wilton family, as well as the First Baptist family, but most of all, on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ, I want to welcome you to a Christian celebration of life. Just a few moments ago, this dear family was huddled together at the cemetery, and they've had a worship service like none other, with the Lord present, with singing and sharing scripture and praying together and thanking God for the precious gift of John's life. And now in the warmth of this building, not just the physical warmth, but the warmth of God's people, the best friends we could ever have, the best friends this family could ever have. We're gonna worship the Lord in this sanctuary by singing songs of faith. We're gonna read scriptures of faith. We're gonna pray prayers of faith. And we're gonna worship the Lord by thanking Jesus for his faithfulness to one of his most precious men of faith, Dr. John Dennis Wilton, who was born October 24, 1925, and who was carried by God's angels into the presence of his Lord and Savior on February the 21st, 2015. The Bible says that precious in the sight of the Lord is the passing of one of his saints. It is a special time, even for the heart of God. Now, saints are not mystical beings who perform spectacular things and then disappear before our very eyes. They're normal people who stay and stay and serve and live and give and thus are called God's people, God's saints. They're normal people, men and women, teachers, fathers, motorbike racers cricket players, fishermen, ordinary people who gave their lives to an extraordinary Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thus, they became the royalty of God. They honored God, and the Lord honors them. Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will save it. Thus the Lord Jesus gives us such a man, Dr. John Wilton. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that today that exaggerations are not necessary because the half of your grace and love and sacrifice for us has yet to be told. And Lord, we do not have to inflate the life of a person like John to cause him to look great in the eyes of men because the half of his story has never been told either. Just a simple man who because someone cared enough for him when he was 32 years of, of age, that someone invited him to Jesus and not only changed his life, but changed our lives. So Lord, we trust you today with this dear family. We want to hear you speak and sing to our hearts and give us a comfort and a courage that we have never experienced in our life before this day. We love you, Lord, and we pray this prayer in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The family has invited us to sing along with them and worship with them as we sing two of John's favorite hymns. What an honor to do that now as a church family. The first one is hymn number 58. I invite you to take a hymnal if you would like. And we'll be standing and singing all three stanzas of Like a River Glorious. Let's stand as we worship together.
Let's pray together. <clears throat> Father, today as we have gathered in this room for the purpose of worshiping you, Father, we want to acknowledge you as our God. And Father, Father, without you, we have nothing and we are nothing. But Father, as we have gathered to worship today, we also want to celebrate the life of one of your chosen servants. Dr. John Wilton. Father, how he has blessed our lives as we've walked this earth together. The words of encouragement, the words of affirmation, the prayers. Father, the teaching from your word and standing in this pulpit and other pulpits around the country as he's opened your word and preached it uncompromisingly. So, Father, today we want to lift high the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not here to worship man, but we're here to worship you, and we celebrate a life of a man who worshiped and followed you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the past few weeks, a passage of Scripture that the Lord has been working on in my heart is found in Matthew chapter 17. And that chapter begins with Jesus, Peter, James, and John. And the story there is about the Mount of Transfiguration. Following right behind that passage of Scripture, the disciples encounter a situation and they can't heal the young man that needed to be healed. And so they came to Jesus, I would assume very frustrated after Jesus stepped in, and Jesus healed the young man. And they said to Jesus, why couldn't we do this? And Jesus said, this kind of faith only comes through prayer and fasting. That led me to the thought of extra, why do extraordinary things never happen to, to ordinary people? And it's because us as ordinary people never put ourselves in a place of God working his faith through us for those extraordinary things to happen. At the age of 32, Dr. John Wilton stepped into that place of beginning a journey in his life of letting the Lord Jesus work in and through him that he became one of those extraordinary people. I was privileged on Saturday evening to be sitting in the living room of Miss Rhoda Bell and Brother John's home. If you ever wanted to be a fly on the wall, I had that opportunity. And my wife and I was there. She was sitting across the room from me on the sofa. I was sitting in a chair. Shelly, the granddaughter, was sitting to her right. Miss Rhoda Bell Granny was across the room to the left. Shelly began to have a conversation with Granny. And she said, she told the story, but Shelley asking questions. And the questions began and about, Granny, did you and Papa ever talk about him dying and going to heaven? And the answer, of course, was yes. And then it pursued, pursued on that 
Miss Rodebell told the story of a young man who was very successful in business, was a great athlete, tennis player, and motorcycle racing, and all those things. But at the age of 32, she told the story of how he came to faith in Jesus Christ. And from that point, his life changed drastically to the point in the words that she used, he went down the street with his Bible, waving his Bible, telling people if they did not give their hearts to Christ, they would spend eternity in hell. Well, if you know Brother John, he moved his life through the Lord Jesus into that of an extraordinary person, a man of prayer, a man of faith, a man after God's own heart. Brother John's last sermon here in this pulpit that was televised on television was taken from a passage of scripture that if it was to be a life verse, he if he were to have a life verse, this most likely could be it. Galatians chapter 2, verses 20 and 21. Brother John preached that day from that passage of scripture. And the title of his message was, A Testimony of God's Grace. You need to get that DVD and listen to it. What a powerful testimony, what a powerful sermon he brought on that particular day. That passage of scripture reads this way. Galatians chapter two, verses 20 and 21. It says, I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and delivered himself up for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needless, needlessly. That sounds just like Brother John for those of us who know him. And his own family said that would be a life verse that they would pin for, on their father. And so today, as we have gathered here to worship the Lord Jesus, we honor this servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, who walked these halls, who walked through our lives, the halls of our lives, who have transcended a lot of miles from that of South Africa and people there who, uh, as our pastor said the other day, has preacher boys over there. And uh, the testimony that he had there and the testimony that he has had in different churches and different places of ministry. And most recently working with the Encouraging Word min television ministry, what, he, what we would call a very simple task but he would sit on the phone and call people who wrote in and said, I'm not sure of my salvation, I want to accept Christ. And Brother John would pick up the phone and he would lead people to Christ. That's what he spent his last days doing. And so today, what an example we have to follow. A legacy of faith that Dr. John Wilton walked, walked right before our very eyes. And I want to close by reading those verses of Scripture again. Galatians 2, verses, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and delivered himself up for me. And I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. Coming now, I want to invite up to the podium Haley, Ross, and Rob, three of Brother John and Miss Rodebell's uh, grandchildren. And so if you'll make your way up here, it would be great. I speak today on behalf of my two sisters, Christy Jane and 
Bridget. All three of us have shared a deep love for our grandfather. He has impacted our lives in ways that will affect us until we ourselves enter eternity. I will mention only one. Grandpa loved his Bible. And every time we were with him, he encouraged us to learn to love our Bibles. He loved his Bible because in it he found words that came alive, words that made him come alive because it revealed the God who is the source and the giver of life. He daily loved to mine the scriptures for its treasures. It was his most favorite pleasure. He studied his Bible with great diligence, patience, and joy for the purpose of knowing God and making him known. It was our privilege and delight to sit at his feet and to listen to him explain the scriptures in order to help us see the glory of God in the person of Jesus Christ. What will we do with the word of God now that he is gone? Will we love it like he did, immerse ourselves in it, find hope and life in it, speak and teach it to others, or will we ignore it and thus ignore the God that it proclaims? Surely we have seen from his life that the word of God is sufficient and powerful and contains the only truth that leads to justification by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and to an eternity beholding his glory. Oh, that we would continue to learn to love our Bibles like John Wilton, our grandfather, did. Hello, my family and fellow friends. Thank you so much for joining us in this time of mourning and also celebrating the life of a truly remarkable man. I called him my papa. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Ross, Murray's son, and uh, I'm speaking on behalf of Kayla and uh, my younger brother, Kemsley, who unfortunately wasn't able to join us, but he's with us in spirit. And I know Greg is as well. Our grandfather was full of generosity, work ethic, humility, selflessness, and most of all, a passion for spreading the love of Jesus to all corners of the world. All of these qualities we admire and qualities I aspire to myself. There are many memories I have of Papa. One of our family favorites is how much we all know he loved ice cream. And he would always manage to find a seat next to Kemsley when he was young and find some way of distracting him. And somehow, by the end of it, before Kemsley knew, his bowl would be completely empty without having a single bite. <laughs> oh, sorry, forgive me one second. Albert Einstein once said, our death is not an end if we can live, live on in our children and the younger generations. For they are us. Our bodies are only wilted leaves on the tree of life. Papa, we will all miss you, but have so many wonderful memories to hang on to. You are a role model, a friend, your guidance and love will carry us through the end of our days. I love you, Papa, and I'll see you again soon. Well, thank you, Ross and, and Haley. Um, what an amazing 
amazing gift from the Lord. To celebrate this, Granny, we've got to hash out something, though, amongst all these grandkids. Because Ross and I were on the plane together last night, flying in, and he told me that you've always said that he was your favorite. <laughs> Granny, you've always said I'm your favorite. So, grandchildren, I'm sorry, I'm her favorite. I don't think so. I mean, it's just, it's clear cut, it's so obvious. Thank you for making me your favorite. But, Granny, we love you so much. Yes, we do. I, I loved hearing this morning that it took Papa five years of courting to win Granny. I think he should have worked for 60 years to earn you. You're so special, and we love you so much. This is the grandmother that when the beats were cranking during warm-ups for basketball games, my teammates would say, who's that grandmother up there getting her groove on? And it was my granny with Papa sitting right next to her being very serious. Our, these grandchildren, we love you. There's one grandchild that couldn't be here, Greg. And he's serving the Lord in Malaysia. And he just wanted to say a quick word of love to you. So let's watch this video together. Hello, Granny. Hello, family. Hello, friends who are there for the celebration of my grandfather, Papa. Man, what a life he lived. And he lived it unto the glory of Jesus Christ. That's his legacy. I'm his grandson. I am so honored to be his grandson. I'm so honored to be in contact with hundreds of people who have mentioned to me over the internet how deeply impacted they were by the life of Papa. He loved the Lord Jesus. He loved Granny and he loved his entire family, his Sunday school class, the churches that he pastored, the ministry that he was part of. I am just so tremendously privileged to be considered his grandson and to carry on his legacy. I'm here in Malaysia together with Abby and I would give anything to be there with you right now, Granny, to be a part of this celebration. But I know Papa would want me to be here, right here, right now, doing what God has called me to do. So I rejoice with all of you and I thank you so much for allowing me to be part of this, even just through a video. I wish that I could be there with you, Granny. My heart hurts because I already miss Papa so much. But my heart is also filled with so much joy because he's in the presence of the King. He has fully received that imputed righteousness that he so often spoke of. He told me so much about the grace of God and the love of Christ, and he is completely overwhelmed by the radiance of Christ's glory. And for that I rejoice and I'm so grateful for my grandfather, Papa. What an amazing legacy for us to carry on as the Wilton family. There's a lot that I could share with you that we have been given to carry on from Papa and from you, Granny. Um, one being the Wilton chuckle. Now, if you've heard Dad or any Wilton laugh with a big ha ha, it's a fake laugh. It's a preacher laugh. If you want to really hear a real Wilton laugh, there's always a and that came from Papa. I'll never forget as a kid recognizing that that came from Papa. But the greatest thing that we learned from Papa was, as Mom shared with us as Papa passed away, his singleness on Jesus and his aim for to me to live as Christ, to die as gain. Two examples for me, the first being an opportunity for me to preach here, right here in this pulpit, I was serving as a pastoral intern. I had just surrendered to gospel ministry, and I got to receive an assignment from Papa who would preach here on Wednesdays. And he gave me the privilege of preaching through the book of Jonah for two weeks. 
He said, you've got to preach for the whole book of Jonah in two weeks. I'm not going to help you. I want to see what you got. I don't need you to knock out chapter 2, chapter 1, chapter 2 in one week, chapter 3 and chapter 4. So, man, I'm working. I'm so excited, and I'm ready for this first sermon. And I get up to preach, and on the front row, I could forget about whoever else was there. I had Papa, I had Bumpa, and I had Dad. That was enough for me. And I had 6,000 pages of notes that I read in 10 minutes. <laughs> Nervous as all get out. I'm feeling kind of good about myself. First Baptist, the Fellowship of Encouragement, comes and encourages me. And we go walking all the way back after the service. And we walk in and Papa says, close the door. I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> and literally, these were his words. Rob, that was the absolute worst sermon I've heard in my life. You just preached Jonah, and you didn't even say the name Jesus. And for the next hour, he taught me how to preach. It goes beyond here. My senior year in college, I had the flu. And we had a huge basketball game. And up at North Greenville, Dad and Bumpa and Papa came up for the game. And I persevered through that game and I played through that game. Wanting to fall over. Ultimately leading our team to win that game. And I'll never forget when Papa and Bumpa and Dad saw me after the game. Papa came up to me and he looked at me and he said, Son, I'm so proud of you. Go live for Jesus like you lived on that court tonight. Watch this video. This was my Papa and his message. The righteous one who gave his life upon the cross his life is my life already. His death is my death already. My death to the condemnation of sin. My death to the power of sin. His resurrection is my resurrection and your resurrection. Can you imagine how valuable it is that you and I should come to faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that we should cast ourselves at His feet because if we don't, we have nothing. Nothing. We commit in the grace of Jesus to carry the legacy of not just John Dennis Wilton, but of Jesus. We love you. Now we have the joy of singing the gospel. It's hymn 147. I believe this must be Brother John's favorite hymn. And can it be? It's the gospel message. We need to sing it as believers from the depth of our hearts today with great fervor and conviction and eternal hope. Let's stand as we worship together. 147.
remain standing, I read what surely Paul has to say in this passage in Romans. It must be so very, very close to the heart of our dear brother John. Romans 8, 1 through 10, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. And to set the mind on the flesh is death, 
but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. For those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. Amen. Please be seated. Brother Steve, you quoted from the book of Romans, and I uh, just want to thank you for doing that so very much. I do not have the occasion as often as Don does to express gratitude and love and thanks to so many of you. Um, this church family has loved us well as a family. We feel very much a part of you, even though we are separated by many miles. And your love and grace during this time is, is profound. Uh, many people may be watching today, some from South Africa, who are getting texts and emails and greetings. I, I wish I could share with you all of the, just the many, many testimonies from people across the world who uh, have been impacted so wonderfully by the life of my dad. And I would say that um, you have loved us well and you have been angels to us. So, uh, so many of you have just been gracious and I know you're going to continue to minister to us and just want to say on behalf of our family, thank you so very much. I remember as a teenager going to Wednesday night Bible study. Dad would have probably a hundred people that would show up at that Bible study. I always felt that his teaching, particularly out of the first eight chapters of the book of Romans, was just so profound, and it captured my attention at that time. He would say, God is at work in all things for the good, of those who love him. I didn't really understand too much about that because I hadn't lived as long as dad had to that point. And uh, I can say to you that, that God really is working all things to the good of those who love him. And we, we are a living testimony to that. Dad was very gifted in the, in the flesh. I remember as an athlete when I was learning to play golf, I would swing at the ball and be closer to the ball after I'd swung than, than when, I when I first placed it. And I'd say, Dad, could you show me how to play the game? And he'd say, certainly, son. And he'd put the ball right down there, whack it a mile, and then say, that's how you do it. <laughs> <laughs> He was so naturally gifted that he found it hard to, to even coach. He just, he just played the game well. He was a tremendous uh, uh, squash player, tennis, squash, was like racquetball. And I remember how proud I felt when I really knew that at age 16 was the first time I actually legitimately beat him at a game of squash. That's how good he was. I remember belonging to the Western Province Cricket Club and loved to play snooker. And I played with all my buddies back there. And one day I said to Dad, hey, Dad, why don't you come down? I'll just clean you up at snooker. I didn't even know he knew what the game was. And he agreed to go, and I kind of snuck him in there hoping that none of my, my buddies would see this game. And they were all watching when Papa just cleaned the table on me. 
He did this, put the snooker skewer back, and he said, are you ready to go now? <laughs> Dad also was a man of discipline in the flesh. Um, uh, one of the things that I loved to do was to watch him in preparation for going to bed. He would uh, put his green pajamas on full length, and then he would walk up to his bed and he would kind of do this with it. He would puff up his pillow, and then he would turn it down and, and he would smooth it over. <laughs> and he would stand back and survey. <laughs> and one of my great delights when I realized this process of preparation was just be, as he was surveying, I'd go and crawl right into that spot. And he would just stand there and look at me, and then I'd pack up laughing. <laughs> Dad also uh, was very disciplined in preaching, and his study was in our home. And he did endless preparation. And his, his study was just neat. It, it marveled me. I mean, the, the pencils were... They were all sharpened to exactly the same length, and, and the eraser was right there, and, and he had a blotting pad and everything. And, and so I would go in there, and I would take one of his pencils. There would always be three. I would take one pencil, and I would just move it slightly out of line. <laughs> and Dad would walk into the study, and it would be, and then suddenly he'd realize what was wrong, and he'd put the pencil back in place, and, and everything would be good in the world again. Dad was tremendously disciplined in the matter of prayer. And uh, we would hear the drone of, of his prayer life. And I know that I have felt the sense of the presence of God, and I believe that we as boys and uh, these children, grandchildren, are mightily blessed because Dad was a man of prayer. Dad was also a man of great personal discipline. You know, as three guys growing up, we weren't always just towing the line as we should have, and sometimes we would get a movie that maybe had a rating of above PG, a little above. And Papa, I, I can remember my dad saying, you boys go ahead and watch that if you want to. I'd prefer not to. He didn't make a big deal about it. He was just very disciplined about what he thought about and what he allowed to come through his eyes. You know, when we talk about his tremendous gifting in the flesh, there's one thing that I would say that Dad was not gifted naturally to do. And I believe that I can best explain it through the Scripture in Galatians chapter 5 that says this, But when God, who set me apart from birth, and called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him. Friends, I, I don't believe that dad naturally was gifted to be an orator, a speaker, or to impart to me the incredible deep truths of the Word of God. That was an anointing that came from his relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Saturday before last, I cannot quite describe, I'm sure some of you understand what I'm saying, but Dad was fairly alert My wife Rachel and I were about to get in the car and head back to, to Alabama. And I had asked the Lord, would there be a moment where Dad would be 
alert enough in the hospital to know that I was there and to be able to respond to me. I asked for that. And just before we got in the car to drive home, that's what the Lord gave. Rachel on this side, and I was looking at Dad, and Dad was looking at me with those eyes. He didn't have his glasses on, but he was looking at me. He knew who I was. And I said, Dad, I want to thank you for being an incredible dad. And I want to thank you most of all for the gift of faith that I believe has come to me because of your relationship with Christ. And Dad, because of that, you are my father, but we are also brothers. We are sons of the Most High God. And I said, Dad, because of that, I'll see you soon. <laughs> and he looked at me, and he mouthed, see you soon and he did this and I know that this very day he's rejoicing in the presence of his Savior he will not come back here but I'll see him soon <laughs> well after listening to Buzz speak I I don't have a lot to say and that means, Rocky, when I'm through, you can just go and sit down. No. <laughs> I think my, my father, our dad, um, would get such joy in seeing his three boys up in the place that he loved more than anything else, not about a, a piece of furniture or a a platform, but just the opportunity to share the love of God in Christ Jesus. Daniel, could you come up and stand here with Poppy? This is Daniel, and this is his Poppy here. My oldest brother's oldest grandson, but he also happens to be Grandpa's oldest great-grandchild. And thanks for coming here with us. You just stand next to Poppy. You know, I was, uh, you know, when you come to a time like this, there's so much. Um, and you know, Daniel, there's going to come a time in, in your life, beginning right now, but years from now, that you're just going to find in your heart, you're going to, Remember, like having a, a good meal when you sit down and have something good to eat and it just fills up your tummy. And you're going to think about, about Grandpa and you're going to remember. And you're going to see. You're seeing that in your daddy. And he gave it to your daddy. He just... Your, your Grandpa is my oldest brother and he loves the Lord Jesus and your daddy loves the Lord Jesus and I love the Lord Jesus and Uncle Buzz over here same thing <clears throat> and these things you will never forget it's called legacy it's what you leave behind and what you pass on you know, we had no idea growing up. And as you look back and, and, and all that love, and I, I tell you what he'd want you to know right now. You know what he'd want you to know? He'd want you to know how thankful he is for all the wonderful people that God brought into his life. He'd, he'd want you to know that, Daniel. And there are just so many. <laughs> Over on this side, there's a... There's a group of people from Pastor John's class that just meant so much to Papa. And there's a congregation, a group of people here today. You know something, Daniel? We've been getting 
notes from Mr. Stone, Mr. Derek Stone. Now, you don't even know who that is. Do you know that he and his, his wife, Miss Peggy, they were the first ones ever that Papa ever married? And people like Mr. Billy Darlow, you know, you'll never probably meet these people. And there are people here called the Meltzers. They're here somewhere, and they just, there's Mr. Meltzer. So hold your hand up there, Mr. Meltzer. See, one of Papa's best friends that came all the way here to be with him. And you look up and down this group, and, and you've heard You've heard these guys, you know, Rob and Ross and Haley and all talk about Papa. And you know the, the bottom line of you can talk about, I'm so grateful that Buzz is, you know, we've got so many memories. Daniel, I'll be so grateful that, that uh, you know, unlike me, you need to know this. This is not about me, but... Your poppy and Uncle Buzz here, when they all went off track and weren't living for the Lord, I was the only one who was perfect. <laughs> Do you know that... Our Father never stopped praying and loving us no matter what we did. I can't tell you the numbers of times that I disappointed my dad. Never stopped praying for us. He never changed. Never changed. There was never any, there was never any condemnation. He never changed. And he raised up generations of people who love the Word of God, the Jared Skinners, the Ed Lacy's preaching the gospel all over the world, impacting their lives, three brothers who love each other so much, three beautiful daughters-in-law that he just loved with all of his heart. You know what he'd want you to know, Daniel? He'd want you to know how much he loved Granny. Do you know, Daniel, that your papa never once in 65 years and altogether 70 years, do you know that his three boys cannot tell you of a single time that we remember that he ever said anything ugly to Granny? Do you know, do you know that your papa remained true and faithful to Granny all his life? All his life, never changed. You know what he called her? Nunu. And that's sweet. <laughs> now I know what you think of when you think of Nunu. His Nunu was just absolutely beautiful. She, he just loved her. And you know what he'd want you to do? Do the same thing. And most of all, your papa loved the Lord Jesus. My father had an uncommon, total, unswerving commitment to Christ. Nothing got in its way. I was sitting one time with Dr. Billy Graham, you know, and a lot of people know Dr. Billy Graham, and, and he had been listening to your papa preach on television, and I walked in, and Dr. Billy Graham said to me, he said to me, you know, if our world could hear people preach about Jesus like your daddy does, he said, that is what will change this world. You see that down there, Daniel, this year? It's in the shape of a cross. Do you know Dr. Billy Graham sent that? That's from him. Because he wanted to honor Papa. He told me that. And he wanted to do it in the shape of a cross. <clears throat> because it's about the Lord Jesus. 
who went to a cross and gave his life, that all who would believe in his name would be forgiven of their sin. And then he'd want you to know, and this is the best part of all of it, Papa is in heaven. He's alive. You know, we gathered this morning as a family. That's what Papa wanted. We went out, the snow was falling. Mm -hmm. We thought to ourselves, how ironic is this, that our father would have been born in KwaZulu-Natal, which has weather sort of like New Orleans, only a little bit hotter. And that on the day we celebrated his home calling, that the snow, it was so beautiful. It was cold. And, and our family went and we stood around that casket. Remember that, Daniel, this morning? And we sang and we began to share and read scripture and praise the Lord Jesus. And Granny got up and I could hardly speak after I heard what Granny said. And we just lifted the name of Jesus because when Papa died, you know something? He didn't actually. Because when you know Jesus, you don't die. Oh, this body does. But Papa was ready to let go of that because he was just taken into the presence of the Lord Jesus. And we're all going to be with him again. We're going to live with him and all who give their hearts and lives to Jesus. That's the message of the cross. And I'm so grateful. We're so grateful. We're so thankful. Gosh, man. We're so thankful that God would have given us a dad who loved the Lord Jesus with all of his heart and with all of his soul and with all of his mind. Yep, brothers, we will continue to do it. We will hold high the name of Jesus. There's one time in, the, in a 24-hour day on a particular day that I hate. It's 12 noon on a Sunday. <clears throat> because I have to stop preaching. I kind of know now why Donald said the three of us will get up and we'll stand there and you go last. <clears throat> that is not fair. I want to say this morning, <clears throat> and it just really dawned on me as I was sitting there with my precious wife, Irene, that today <clears throat> there's a sense in which <clears throat> it has to be the happiest day of my life. As I try and think of other days, this is one of the, the most amazing experiences. And I could take that and run with it for an hour. Brother Sell, you'll never forget what I'm about to say to you. You quoted a scripture and you didn't tell us where it was. Psalm 116, 15, precious are those in the sight of the Lord. Who? The death of the saints. How could we not but consider this a precious day and the death of a saint, my father? A saint because of the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ, and if you had known my father like we know him, we know that he claimed righteousness 
only because of Jesus. And then, so let me just, before I go to the scripture on the back, which has already been read this morning, um, just tell you that I prepared to say something, and it was based on what I did a few hours early one morning as I was sitting watching my dad. I, I realized that what Karen said at the graveside today was exactly true about my father. In many respects, he had nothing to say, nothing, very little to say except about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That was the mark of his faithfulness. It was to the Word of God. It was a man of prayer that we've spoken about. I remember as a 16-year-old listening to Dad through the glass doors and we'd eat our breakfast and he would still be in his study and he always prayed out aloud. And it was prayer according to the Word of God. And his hope, he died in hope of being ushered into the eternal presence of Christ. And it was a hope that came from the Scriptures. So I sat down early that morning, and for my own blessedness through the years that lie ahead, I, I wrote down Scriptures that would be precious to him. So for my soul's sake, I've written them down. And then last night I went with a red pen and I highlighted a bit. I, I love to doodle. And I would encourage you, make your Bible a treasure of blessing because you discover things and then you, you write down and you tell the Lord, you spoke to me this day and that day. So I'm closing my Bible, and the first scripture that I had there was Romans chapter 8. And when I first looked at the bulletin, Don, there in your study, I didn't think there was anything on the back, and I came and I sat down here, and I believe in God's perfect providence and his timing sometimes where you sense the Spirit of God working through providence and this scripture has come to us as the people of God this morning. So I'm ending by preaching the word and simply going to take you back to this scripture. You have it. Fold it up. Put it in your pocket. Carry it around with you. Don't let it go until it burns into your soul and radically changes your life. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ, hidden in Him, found in Him, when you wake, when you sleep, when you eat, doing all to the glory of God. Walking worthy of your calling. Let me read it and I'll end. Just the first four verses again. Would you look at the scriptures? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God this morning. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit, capital S, the Holy Spirit of life, a law principle, as my dad would say to me so often, has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. The body in that casket has gone into the ground. 
but it's only the body, and the day is going to come when the first in Christ will rise physically in body and be joined to their spirit with all the saints in glory, so numerous that it's described like the sand on the seashore. For what God has done, for God has done what the law, what you cannot do, weakened by the flesh, he did it by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. The only time that my dad was ever a happy, wholesome man was when he was walking in the Spirit. And he did much of his life. And when he sinned and failed, and he failed us miserably at times, he would come back, and I remember him saying, Rod, there's only one thing that I will boast about. When I'm ushered into the presence of the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords is you are my righteousness. And if you're a Christian this morning, that's your only boast. Christ's righteousness is your righteousness. May the Lord bless us with his presence. And may the word of God penetrate our hearts this morning. If you don't know Christ... Seek him with all your heart. And the promise of God is that you will find him. And it'll not be because of you. It's got something to do with the eternal covenant of grace that is manifested in time through the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we must live our lives as though he could come before we walk out of this church. And if you walk out of this church and you play churchianity and you're playing with God, you are to be pitied more than all men. For we believe in the resurrection of the dead in Christ Jesus unto eternal life. God has designed us for that. May God draw you to himself, even this hour. Thank you.
How great thou art, how great thou art. When through the woods and forest glades I wander and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down from lofty mountain grandeur and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze. That God, his son not sparing, sent him to die. I scarce can take it in. And on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died. Take away my sin, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art. of acclamation and take me home. What joy shall fill my heart when I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my God, how great My Savior God to thee. How great thou art. How great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. Steve. Rocky, I hope you and Murray, Pastor Don, I wish we had just another whole day for the people here to just embrace you. There'll be time for that. But I just want you to know, Ms. Rodebell, how much we love you. And we, we speak on behalf of thousands of people whose lives have been touched by Mr. John. And we feel the presence of the Lord in such a way, just like uh, when Jesus was transfigured and his apostles said, we don't want to go, we just want to stay here. And we really mean that with all of our heart. In closing, and I want to read to you just a, a compilation, just a brief compilation of 
remarks that have been made, not just in these past few days, but over the years, of people from Greg in, in uh, Asia there to people just the other day that said, make sure you say this, make sure that he, you tell this about John. Even in the hallway, Dr. Don, as Eric Kirkendall said, I want you to, you got to know this. When Dr. Don, when Dr. John was in the hospital and uh, the nurse said to him, uh, Dr. Wilton, I need to take you to the car in a wheelchair. And he said, no, you're not. And she said, yes, I am. He said, no, you're not. He said, I am not doing this. And he said, I'm not sure you're going to like how this ends. <laughs> so many people want to say so much. And I want to encourage you to keep telling the stories of John. Tell the stories of Jesus in your life. So let me just read this in summary for a few moments. Starting with this phrase. And this is written by coaches and Sunday school members and friends and co-ministers. So what shall we say about the Christian husband, father, grandfather, pastor, teacher, fellow knight of the round table, the man after God's own heart, John Dennis Wilton. His children rise and call him blessed. His wife is honored everywhere she goes and is well taken care of by the people that you and John took care of for 65 years together. Friend, mentor, a gift of God to his fellow ministers and to their children who were privileged to sit at his feet, hoping someday to be just like him. He taught us that to have Jesus and his word in our hearts was like to be a racehorse, ready to run as soon as God would open the gate. On Sundays in the church parlor, he would often look at his watch and he would say, Crawford, let's get on with it, brother. I've got something very important to say. To which the reply was, you always have something important to say. And he always did. How can one man touch so many of us with God's grace and truth? The answer is Jesus. Many of us here would not be here if it wasn't for the faith that John had in Jesus and John had in us. He told us the truth even when it hurt our pride. He would often say, if it doesn't help you with your daily walk with the Lord, it ain't worth a hill of beans. He prevented many of his preacher boys from growing up to be cowboys or door-to-door -door cricket paraphernalia salesmen. He believed in us. And Rhoda Bell, you taught our ladies to be Christian women full of graciousness, gracefulness, and virtue, defined only by Jesus and driven by his love and his purpose for them. What a team. It's interesting how John would avoid the applause of men, but at the same time, be the first one to build you up with sincere compliments and encouragement. He taught his sons to teach us that in Christ more is possible than you could ever imagine. And this Jesus whom we serve is worth losing everything for, but actually in Christ we gain more life than we could ever lose. So maybe the right question is not, what shall we say to celebrate Jesus and his servant John? The correct question should be, what shall I do? Or better yet, what will I let Jesus do with my life? You may not move 10,000 miles from home. You might not have 18 great-grandchildren. But you can change the world by giving your whole heart to Jesus and then bring one person to Christ as well, one person like John. 
who now leaves a legacy of faith that is clear enough for anyone to follow, true enough for his children and grandchildren to devote their lives to, and bold enough to stand for Christ in the face of any adversity. And he would say today, I want everybody to be with me in heaven someday. And I want to just ask you today, if you're like me, you've just felt the Lord speak to you in a way that is hard to describe. Maybe you're here today like John was 30, at age 32, and you're saying, you know, I, my life isn't a life at all. I know a lot about God and church and stuff, but I've never settled it. My relationship with God is a mixture of grace and my good works and hoping I'll be good enough to go to heaven someday. And you're miserable. But you don't have to be because today, the same Jesus that knocked on John's heart's door is knocking on your door. And you can leave this place settling it once and for all that you've given your life to Jesus by grace alone. So before we pray, let's just bow our heads for a minute and pray the most important prayer. Maybe you want to pray this in your heart. My Heavenly Father, I know that you love me very much. That is so obvious. I also know that I'm a sinner. That's obvious too because everyone is. But thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die for my sins, to rise from the dead, conquering even death for me. Please forgive me of my sins, past, present, and future. And by grace alone, not by one stitch of my goodness, or my religion or rituals, but by grace alone, your amazing grace, I surrender my life to Jesus Christ as my Lord and my Savior. Save me right now, permanently. Adopt me into your heart and help me to grow now more and more, to be more and more alive until the day you take me home. I settle it today, and I thank you for saving me right now. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you pray that prayer today, find some way to let this family know. And I know many of you, I believe with all my heart, have prayed that prayer today. Let them know some way. I gave my heart to Jesus. I just wanted you to know about that. Thank you for John Wilton. Thank you that he proved to me that God could take anyone and make him a somebody for Jesus. John fought the good fight, the good fight of faith. He finished the race for souls. He kept the faith in the one who never, ever let him go. And he has been awarded the crown of life by Jesus himself to whom is given all glory and honor and praise, but who graciously said to John, well done, well done, John, my good and faithful servant. Rodabel, sons, the Wilton family, we promise to guard you with our love and our prayers always, and to be true to the Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Would everyone except the family please stand at this time? In a moment, the Wilton family will be escorted out, even as we pray for them. Thank you again on their behalf for giving so much love to John and to them today and in the days to come. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we truly have been with you. 
Dr. John did it again. He ushered us into the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ in a way that our hearts burned and our souls became glad. Thank you that the snows remind us today though our sins were as scarlet, they'll, they are now white as snow. But because we're in Christ, we have everything that we need. So Lord, we send this family into the days ahead with our prayers and our love and our commitment to serve the Lord with all of our heart and our soul and our mind and our strength. So that not only people like John would be proud of us, but that Jesus himself would say the same thing he said to John. Well done, well done, thou good and faithful servant. We pray these things in the powerful name of the Lord Jesus Christ and for his sake, amen.